I would like to give, uh, and since you asked about paper, uh, probably let me give you a, in a little bit some data. Uh, this was from uh, you know financial year 2018-19 from the uh, Indian Paper Manufacturers Association. This is this is the published data based on their survey of their uh, stakeholders, right? What we are looking at is about uh, 18 or you know close to 20 odd million tons, and this is pre-COVID, right? And you know. Of course, in the in the current calendar year, the numbers will actually be lower. But we are looking at about uh, you know twenty odd million tons, which is both paper that is produced domestically, pulp which is imported, or high quality paper which is imported, and some part of it is exported. So that's the net that we are looking at. Uh, what does that mean? You know, what does that translate into? You know, very very crude thumb roll. Okay, anywhere between eighteen and twenty kgs is equivalent to one tree. That was right from the middle of this week's episode. Hello and welcome to yet another podcast episode on the Mission Chunya channel. As always, I am here to bring you yet another story and a conversation, a conversation that will encourage you to do a bit more to live a sustainable lifestyle. This week's topic is all about paper and the work done by Forest Stewardship Council, FSC. But the guest who joins me on the chat is a very passionate storyteller. In fact, his work was recently recognized by the Prime Minister of India, Mr. Narendra Modi, in his monthly broadcast to the nation, Man Ki Baat. Amar is the country head for FSE in India, and he is also the founder of the Gata story. Before we get to the conversation, just want to remind you that the usual action item will be there towards the end of the conversation with Amar. I'm sure you will enjoy every bit until then. Without further ado, here's the feature segment for this week. Hello, Amar. Welcome to the Mission Chunya podcast. Agreesh, get to great to be here, uh, and you can see that I am stuttering and stammering already. So you know, I hope that the conversation goes a lot smoother than the beginning. <laughs> it definitely will. Amar, as a professional, how's your journey been? Because as a person, you have done a lot of things. You wear multiple hats, do a lot of things in your life. So, how's your professional journey been? Uh, it's interesting, Girish, that you mentioned about uh, me wearing multiple hats. Uh, so you know, one of the quirky habits that I have is uh, whenever I see a cap or a hat, I put it on for a, you know an hour or so and probably just put it away again. And incidentally, as we are speaking right now, uh, I am wearing a hat that we had purchased while we were uh, traveling to Turkey a few years ago. And, uh, you know, that's the hat I'm wearing. So under the guise of this hat, my mission today is to have a conversation that will hopefully add value to the listeners of uh, this podcast, right? So uh, that's uh, that's the, the mission, I guess. And uh, with that, uh, a little bit about myself. I am the India Country Manager for Forest Stewardship Council, uh, which is uh, based in Germany. It's a nonprofit in the forestry space, uh, both on the forest management and products that come out of forest. Uh, and we, I'm sure we will talk more about that as we go along. I am, I am also the co-founder of Gatha Story, along with my wife. Uh, we are a podcasting company uh, based right here in Bengaluru. And uh, we have been podcasting for, gosh, now almost five years now. So, you know, our shows are Bal Gatha, Dev Gatha, Veer Gatha, and uh, Fairy Tales of India. And of course, My Kitab, which is on book publishing. But this is not what uh, I started out uh, my career with. I got my master's in construction management from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in the U.S. I uh, worked in the U.S. for about uh, six or seven years, moved back to India, uh, worked in construction and real estate development, uh, did not quite like the way things are being done here, even today in construction, uh, when it comes to labor, labor and environmental regulations mainly, or not adhering to, to them, I guess. So I decided to take a break from construction, uh, went to IIM Ahmedabad, uh, got my MBA, ended up with uh, Schneider Electric in energy consulting space. Uh, so uh, how to optimize energy in buildings, uh, you know, data centers uh, along the electrical grid. Uh, those are some of the things that we uh, looked at. A lot of it was theory. Uh, and this was back in 2012, 13, 14, thereabouts. Uh, seemed like, uh, you know, very, very slow moving, very frustrating. Fast forward to 2020, uh, we probably caught a lot, a lot of those developments, which were theory back then. 
are probably actual solutions or applications available under the IoT umbrella. So uh, that's that's it. Uh, I think after Schneider Electric, uh, yeah, I, I had a stint with Amazon. You know, that's what brought us to Bengaluru from Gurugram. And um, there I was setting up uh, the warehouses or the fulfillment centers from where you get your merchandise that you order. Uh, again, uh, you know, back to construction in a way, but uh, very different organization, you know, very different beast to deal with. Uh, but it required a lot of travel. Uh, in fact, in calendar year 2015, I was in the office only for one five, 15 days out of the entire, you know, 220 odd whatever working days. So it was affecting, uh, you know, family life. It was affecting uh, health and a lot of other things. So decided to call it quits in 2016, January. We founded Katha Story. Uh, a year and a half later, the opportunity from FSC came across. I would also like to talk uh, briefly about how I came to be associated with FSC. So um, I'm also a lead accredited professional. So, you know, something like a CA, a chartered accountant for green buildings. Uh, they, you know, we audit and certify and things like that. Um, I had learned about FSC certified wood, uh, you know, more than a decade ago. And some of that name resonated with me. So uh, around May 2017, uh, there was this, uh, you know, somebody pinged me on LinkedIn and sent me this link saying that, uh, hey, Amar, there's this job profile that looks interesting and you should probably uh, apply for it. As uh, luck would happen, it was actually the last day to apply, and the deadline to apply was probably midnight uh, Central European time. That time, uh, my wife Mrunal, uh, you know, she was, uh, she was working, uh, you know, little away, distant from where we lived. Uh, so, you know, she would come back around 7.30 in the evening. I got this message around 6 o'clock or thereabouts. So I read it. Uh, it was a bit exciting, but I sat on it saying that uh, I'm already doing Gatha story and, you know, I don't really want to uh, divert my focus elsewhere. But once Brunal came back after dinner, I showed her the link and her only question to me was, uh, you know, you know, you want to do it. Why aren't you applying? <laughs> uh, and, and I think that was a strong feedback that, you know, all these years I've been talking about doing something in this space and here is an opportunity and why am I not even applying, you know, let alone, uh, you know, converting the role, converting and you I accepting and things like that. Um, and I was very clear. I was very, very blunt saying that I do not come from the forestry background. In fact, you know, I come from construction, which is probably the biggest culprit, uh, you know, or the biggest consumer of the products that come out of forest, right? But these are my thoughts and these are my opinions, right? Uh, that is another thing to say about, uh, about FSC as an organization that, you know, they are open to these conversations, right? They are willing to engage and entertain a, a, an absolute outsider, hear their views, and maybe either adapt them, tweak them, uh, or reject them, right? But it's not a re an outright rejection that you are an outsider. Sorry, we cannot entertain you. And here we are. And incidentally, today, I complete three years with FSC. So, you know, it's, it's, I'm, I'm as excited to talk about it today as I was, I guess, the day I joined Kirish. Wonderful. Oh, that's a phenomenal journey, Omar, I should say, like quite diverse. I feel I, I justified what I said when I said that you wear multiple hats and uh, you've definitely spent a lot of time doing various activities and probably been successful in all of them. And I must tell all the listeners that Gatha Stories, I mean, usually all the podcasters in India call that a network of podcasts because you run a host of shows and host of successful shows. So that's great work. Keep it going. And uh, yes, your work in FSC is something that we are going to talk about. Paper is something that we haven't spoken about in detail in the podcast so far. So it's a good opportunity to talk about this industry because it's, it's an essential resource. But whatever is happening in forest destructions, be it for varied reasons, is really catastrophic. So can you give us some numbers on what percentage of forests that are destroyed go into for paper making interesting question though i would like to uh, put a slight amendment to that question if that's okay with you girish sure. so i would like to expand it to paper timber and packaging and and i'll tell you why because all these three industries are directly dependent on the trees that are harvested from the forest so you know i would, I, would, I should say trees plus bamboo but anyway so I would like to give, uh, and since you asked about paper, uh, probably let me give you a, in a little bit some data. Uh, this was from, uh, uh, you know, financial year 2018-19. Uh, 
from the uh, Indian Paper Manufacturers Association. Yeah, so um, this is this is the published data based on their survey of their uh, stakeholders, right? What we are looking at is about uh, eighteen or you know close to twenty odd million tons, and this is pre-COVID, right? And you know, of course, in the in the current calendar year, the numbers will actually be lower. But we are looking at about uh, you know twenty odd million tons, which is both paper that is produced domestically, pulp which is imported, or high quality paper which is imported, and some part of it is exported. So that's the net that we are looking at. Uh, what does that mean? You know, what does that translate into? You know, very very crude thumb rule. Okay, anywhere between eighteen and twenty kgs is equivalent to one tree. Yeah. So oh. uh, for those who are mathematically inclined, they can probably translate that into number of trees. Okay, and I use that uh, that number with a caveat because uh, you know if it's a younger tree, uh, you know a species that grows faster, it's taller, skinnier tree versus a tree that's been around you know for much longer, and a you know, lot of variables in that. But just go with that, you know, for 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 sake of our discussion. Now, uh, interestingly enough, paper is not the main cause of uh, uh, you know uh, forest cover being lost. Agriculture is. Mm-hmm. Fortunately or unfortunately, not a lot of people talk about it and you know use that as one of the the primary factors. Uh, timber harvesting is certainly construction, uh, furniture, uh, you know, so on. Uh, incidentally, government of India uh, recently has allowed a use of uh, timber harvested from forest again in public buildings. There, there was a cap, you know, there was a ban on it for a certain number of years. Uh, again, without getting into specifics, uh, the demand for timber will increase because of that. So that will continue to be the main responsible party among the, the industries. When we are talking about paper, wood and bamboo combined account for about 25% of the overall volume. So, you know, they're not the major contributor. Waste paper and recycled paper actually accounts for close to 60% or, or three, you know, two, uh, three-fifths of the overall uh, paper production, right? The rest of it will be uh, agricultural residue, uh, bagasa coming from sugarcane and, you know, wheat straw and things like that, right? India, incidentally, imports a lot of paper. Uh, a few years ago, uh, there was a, you know, a huge dependence on, on newsprint. There was recycled uh, pulp coming in largely from Eastern European or CIS countries and so on. The domestic paper production uh, over the past 10 years has grown three times. Okay, and uh, I guess I, I'll be happy to send you across the links that you could probably add in the show notes. Uh, I'll not throw numbers uh, just for the sake of numbers, but I'll probably talk in the absolute. Uh, the dependence on imports actually first doubled uh, between 2010 and 2017, and then it dropped, and it's probably at uh, you know close to that uh, levels today, right? So this this is the long and short of the paper industry in India, and if you were to uh, you know classify it a little bit further. Uh, we're looking at yeah. paper used in newsprint, paper used for uh, you know specific industries. So there, there could be banking and financial services. There could be uh, you know obviously you know uh, security um, paper. Right? That's your stamp papers, or to a very small extent, of course, currency notes and things like that. Right. So special paper you got uh, for printing, whatever you use in your office space and so on. Right. So those are the and and of course notebooks and textbooks. Yeah. And that's the reason why I mentioned earlier that this calendar year, the production has gone down because, you know, obviously uh, the schools and uh, education is going online. Coming to uh, packaging, great uh, push on sustainable packaging by the regulators as well as uh, adoption by the industry, right? In fact, uh, I just got a a package. It was was a HDMI cable to connect uh, my laptop to my monitor. It came in a plastic and it actually had like a a paper sheet attached to it saying that, you know, we we are focusing on minimal packaging now. And that paper was, uh, you know, that packaging paper was most likely recycled. Yeah, so which is great. I mean, you know, I think we are, a lot of things are moving in the right direction. Uh, it is not moving in the right direction in terms of timber. We import a lot of it from uh, Southeast Asia as well as uh, from Central Africa. Some of it is through the formal channels. A lot of it is not. And I'll probably stop at that because uh, that's a whole new conversation in itself. Oh, those are really interesting numbers, I'm sure. Uh... As you said, I'll include the links to the numbers because those are really interesting stats that you don't get it in one place and you summed it up really well. Now, generally, the question that people would rightly have is paper seems to be a material that's been recycled for a long time, but still the idea that we import a lot of paper in India, is that due to the demand being like significantly outgrowing the supply? 
that is one you know one uh, obvious or you know a logical answer in this case uh, i think logical being more obvious uh, or more appropriate than obvious i guess the other reason is that uh, there were many state run uh, newsprint mills so i was in high school probably in the 90s in geography textbook they used to teach that you know where the newsprint mills are in india you know there was a big one government run uh, at a place called nepanagar i believe it's in madhya pradesh uh, was in madhya pradesh i don't know if it still is in the sense you know uh, is it in chhattisgarh Correct. or 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 not but uh, anyway uh, coming to the point a lot of these mills have closed down the private ones uh, are focused more on other categories of paper right uh, so again uh, like i'd mentioned before it could be for uh, paper that is uh, that goes in fact uh, some of it would be specialty paper for for food uh, food products right all the tetra packs that you get your juices in for example uh obviously the margins are higher there that's a category that's growing higher so the the focus has moved away i guess that is one reason uh the other reason is that uh, uh you know where you source uh the raw material for uh, for for newsprint for example right earlier on it was cheaper to import and that's why the import volumes went up and then suddenly uh the regulator as well as a few other i guess influencers and decision makers realized that's actually a drain on the foreign exchange so you know that kind of that was probably one of the reasons for the dip so that's that's the uh, one of the reasons um i would also like to talk a little bit about uh, the um the textbook part okay um there was a huge uh, import of uh, textbooks and uh, you know story books and comic books from the cis countries the former uh, soviet union republics right uh, about 4 or 5 years ago and this happens in cycles i was actually talking to a gentleman who was uh, uh, probably in the in the in the government service active service a bureaucrat in the early 80s and uh, this person told me situation was no different you know so india used to import lots of textbooks and comic books and things like that from the soviet union so there could be some oh. you know historical legacy reasons for this to happen okay. not just demand and supply and price so there could be some certain other variables which i haven't uh, honestly gotten into that's really interesting um, especially the angle of importing because of a legacy issue now what now looking at particularly what fsc does how did fsc actually begin what what is the origin story of fsc and uh, if probably one success story of of fsc in india or globally that you have on top of your mind again you know interesting set of questions i will probably try and answer them uh you know as concisely as possible because uh the story of how fsc was formed is a story story in itself so fsc or forest stewardship council uh, actually was formed in the mid 90s uh, around 1994 uh it is uh, so you know those who are in the financial services sector might be familiar with the term fund of funds right uh so fsc is actually a ngo of ngos and and other stakeholders right uh it has a very unique structure in the sense that it is completely membership driven organization and then there is an executive body which actually implements the uh, agenda or the strategy which is approved by the by the membership or the governing board in in general right so in that sense it's a very very unique organization you know it's as distributed as uh, you know loose a network can one can think of uh at the same time uh you know some of the uh, earlier supporters uh, were the worldwide uh, life fund for nature the wwf uh, and a few other organizations and of course over the years there has been churn you know some organizations have moved on others have joined in and then there are three principal buckets or three chambers as fsc likes to call it uh, who actually constitutes the membership body and the members could be individual or corporates or organizations and institutions right but largely they belong to one of the three chambers which would be social economic and environmental and that's the other unique part about fsc that every you know every governing body every decision has to be taken uh, by equal representation from each of the three chambers so that you know we call it chamber balance so that there is no bias towards one uh, at the cost of another right all the decisions are taken through intense level of debates discussions it's it's a very slow moving beast yeah uh, that's one of the downsides of it but the the upside is the decisions are taken taking you know taking in multiple factors into account and that's how it is right in terms of uh, uh, the forestry space 
and not because I represent FSE, but uh, one of the reasons why I joined FSE, by the way, was uh, in terms of, uh, you know, sustainable forestry standards, it's at the very top. You know, it doesn't get more complex, more comprehensive, but at the same time, more resilient than that. Than, than that. Yeah. There are 10 guiding principles. So when we're talking about uh, the resources coming out of a forest, first thought comes to mind is timber and, you know, non, uh, honey and things like that. But what about the people? What about the animals? What about tree species that may be unique or, you know, they are endangered? So red sanders, for example, right, in this region. That, you know, FSC, there are 10 principles. They very clearly uh, list out the do's and don'ts saying that you have to comply with these standards for, uh, you know, for you to be associated with us. So I think uh, uh, over the years, you know, trying to implement them universally has been a challenge. It may not, you know, it's not a one size fit all situation, of course. But uh, the thing is, it is as, uh, you know, global and as comprehensive as possible. Yeah, that's about, uh, you know, FSE. You asked about success for FSE, uh, either globally or in India. Let me give you an example about the success in terms of, uh, you know, uh, number one, large brands that support FSE. Okay, it's a who's who out of the Fortune 500. We've got McDonald's, uh, Kimberly Clark, uh, there is IKEA, H&M being some of the brands that uh, support uh, Tetra Pak, of course. And I do not want to, you know, mention a few brands at the cost of others. You know, every brand has uh, supported and, you know, uh, within India, it's Aditya Birla Group, for example. Uh, they, they all have uh, really invested their resources. It's not just, you know, monetary investment, uh, but it's also the executive time. It's also the, you know, involving their you know, incorporating FSE uh, approaches into their global strategies. And, you know, some of them have gone ahead and declared it in their annual reports or to the stock market saying that our compliance with FSE would be a certain percentage, you know, by by within a certain timeline, right? So th that's a success, you know, industry adapting it, large brands really supporting it. Uh, and they have actually influenced uh, this message down their value chains. So we get a lot of inquiries in India from suppliers uh, who actually uh, supply to some of these brands, you know, either domestically or internationally, saying that my customer wants me to go ahead and get the FSC certificate. How do I go about it? So this pull coming in rather than a push, you know, even especially in this market, who having to go out and reach out to the small and medium enterprises and asking them to make this investment. Uh, and again, it's not just financial, right? For them, it will be documentation. It will be actually an audit of their processes. It will be a lot of rethink on their part uh, from the way they have been doing things, right? Uh, it requires transparency. It's a mindset change uh, that is required. And, and I'm really glad that uh, there is a pull happening. And, and, you know, fortunately, I don't really have to go out and knock on knock on doors of offices saying that, uh, you know, would you like to go ahead and get the, get the certification, metaphorically speaking. That's good. In a market where there is pull and uh, it's a good market to work on, I'm sure you're in a good position where there is a lot of people who are approaching you to get certification. Now, if you look into the certification process, can you briefly give us an overview of how the certification process works? I'm sure many uh, in the audience and you included would be familiar with the ISO series of certifications. Hmm. Right. Yeah. So there is a body uh, called the International Standards Organization who actually holds the IP or they develop these standards. Uh, they promote these standards. Adoption is done by you know, individuals or organizations or businesses. The actual auditing and the certification is done by auditors. Right. Or cert in, in FSC parlance, we call them certification bodies. So FSC uh, as a process is very similar in this nature. So FSC has uh, well, largely two sets of certifications or two sets of standards. One is for management of forests. So in the Indian context, it will be largely dealing with the state forest departments uh, or the, uh, uh, well, I guess, or, or even at the central government level, right? So that is the forestry management or FM certification. And uh, I like to call it more as the supply side certification, right? Because that's where the supply of raw material is coming from. Then we have the demand side or, or the certification by the processors, uh, you know, the traders, uh, the or, um, the packagers and the end users, right? So the downstream side is called uh, the COC or chain of custody certifications. And uh, this is what I like to call as the demand side, because this is where the demand for the certified raw material, the pulp, the timber, etc. is coming from, right? 
So, uh, the, you know, depending on the nature of your business and uh, again, first of all, uh, you have to. So, uh, OK, let me take a step backwards and say uh, within India, uh, our focus is on timber, paper, packaging, rubber and textiles, largely speaking. And of course, there are other like handicrafts and there could be certain unique ones. Recent months, a lot of startups in the sustainable uh, you know, female hygiene products or uh, some, you know, pre-COVID again, people importing latex from EU and selling mattresses in India. These are the kind of organizations who are actually looking for the certification because then they can go ahead and publish that on their packaging. And then, you know, that's that's what helps them A, differentiate, B, probably help, you know, uh, command a premium uh, compared to the competition, right? The process is actually very uh, compartmentalized. We don't involve ourselves in the auditing process or even the selection of the auditor process so to give an example from uh, the mahabharat right when um, you know jayadrath had to be killed and he had to be killed before sunset and you know krishna then goes ahead and does what you know his godly things and finally jayadrath is standing right there and krishna says this is sun this is the jayadrath you know this jayadrath go ahead and, and uh, kill him right similarly our job is that uh, you know this is the certification body and, uh, you know, this is the company. And by no means I'm trying to imply I'm Krishna, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but the logic is this, you know, the arms less length distance part saying that um, we have a list of frequently asked questions. So if uh, there is there was to be an inquiry coming in saying that uh, we are looking for uh, FM or FSE certification, how do we go about it? Uh, so there's a there's a frequently asked questions that's sent across to them along with the list of the certification bodies. The company in turn contacts the certification body. The financial transaction is done between them. And uh, we get reported uh, at the end of the process whether the company received the certification or not. So uh, that's kind of, you know, that works very well, uh, has its pluses and minuses. But I think in our experience, it has more pros than cons. And that's the reason why we've probably followed this process so far. That's very good to know. Uh, there are a lot of pros than cons. We spoke about all the good things of how the system works and how it even follows and how big brands adopt to sustainable practices and we sustainable forestry and everything. But I'm sure there are stories where forests are just destroyed in an unsustainable way. What's your take on that? Sure. So, uh, in fact, um, before that, uh, what hurts us equally, uh, and I'm talking more about as an, uh, you know, not just as an organization, but also as an emotional investment, right? What really hurts us is a forest department who has gone ahead and received a, a forest management certification, they go ahead and decide to cancel it overnight. And we had that happen this year. Unfortunately, uh, nearly 90% of the forestry area in India, which was uh, under the FM certification, which had received FM certification, overnight, all these certificates got cancelled for, you know, for a variety of reasons, which I shall not uh, like to get into, right? That hurts, you know, that uh, really hurts because uh, the reason is that, and I'm not saying that the forests that are not certified are harvested or logged in unsustainable manner. And conversely, I'm also not making any, you know, uh, giving any assurances or making any claims right now on this call that a forest with a forest management certification, everything will be kosher, right? Uh, that is where the the audits that's where the transparency that is where the uh, the chain of custody those are the uh, checks and balances that are built in to ensure compliance right now coming back to the question that you had asked that uh, you know the unsustainable either felling of trees or conversion of forest zones into uh, paid for mining or things like that right those are bigger issues that probably require a collective to work together and nfse has been a part of some conversations, uh, you know, uh, in the Asia Pacific region and government of India, I think it's still under uh, review. Uh, they have a new forest uh, policy, so we actually went ahead and gave the uh, gave our feedback to it uh, to this particular policy. There are, uh, you know, again, uh, depending on which side of the argument you are at, there are certain clauses in there uh, which say that uh, private sector companies can go ahead and uh, have plantations within forest zones. You know, and uh, some are in favor of it, others are not. There are policies uh, from uh, government of India, uh, so, sorry, state governments uh, in Maharashtra and Karnataka. It's called a land pool policy. So if you've got barren land, uh, you know, 
a collective of farmers comes together they go ahead and plant and you know actually convert that barren land into a forest we like that but unfortunately in terms of scale and size that's very minor compared to the uh, converse which we typically hear more and more about right uh, large scale filling of trees conversion you know water supply or a dam project coming in forest getting submerged and things like that these are issues which uh, you know uh, again within the fsc network and india has about 32 members uh, we would love to have a lot more given the size of the country but that's where the membership also plays an active role you know they bring in they bring up some some, some of these issues or they go ahead and represent or speak on behalf of uh, you know of us at such forums right there is also the the regulatory uh, you know surprises that come in sometimes right i spoke about the cancellation of the forest uh, management certification similarly a few years ago government of india declared that uh, bamboo is a grass uh, technically and logically it is and therefore uh, you know all the land or the forest land that was under fm certification but had primarily bamboo all of that certification disappeared overnight wow that also hurt us in a way because the organizations had made investment they followed adhere to the best practices and it's not just the you know tree cover that is going away again you're talking about animals bird species you were talking about the people over there a lot of things get affected uh, by such uh, decisions that have a big impact right fortunately or unfortunately that's been the case in many countries so uh, what we are trying to do and and you know on the plus side there have been certain uh, uh, regulations or certain regimes that actually have are in very much in line with what you know our philosophy or what we stand for so it's a mixed bag you know it's a, it's i think again i would say overall between 1994 and and now uh, i think there have been more pluses than minuses and uh, but if we calculate the scale uh, you know i'm talking about data points right uh, more pluses than minuses i think in terms of scale the minuses outweigh unfortunately it's again you know it's it's a journey we can't really take and and actually let me let me actually uh, take a pause here and talk about the fsc's roadmap the goal is to have 200 million hectares of, of forest along uh, you know worldwide certified you know that's that's a huge amount of forest cover we are talking about uh, india unfortunately less than has uh, less than 1 lakh hectares right now okay long way to go for us here uh, so what you do is you pull up your socks and probably just scale up your ambitions to counter some of these uh, issues right and probably that takes the uh, the debates that takes the fight and i mean that in a good way that takes the fight uh, to a different level or a different forum and it probably changes the arena altogether right before i get to the point where you're talking about the scale factor and what's happening in india at this point in time i just i want to reemphasize that i like the way you put it uh, cutting down trees is just not for the material that it provides it's also for the ecosystem that it supports for the various species associated with the forest it's a good thought i'm sure a lot of people when probably listen to forest just think of the resources that we get but not of the entire ecosystem so that's one good point now because we have spoken about the current situation in india i don't know if i don't ask this question now probably listeners will probably feel it wasn't a justified conversation <laughs> because recently there has been a lot of debate going on around uh, the new draft policy on the environmental impact also the other thing is like india in its indc has pledged to have a good amount of carbon sink now as an industry observer or an agency like an fsc where do you see things in place does the new draft policy and the other actions that the government is doing does it align with it plans to have a a big carbon sink by 2030 do you think there is an alignment in the way the plan and everything is put forward uh, i would like to answer this question in two parts okay one is one uh, my own personal opinion when it comes to the whole carbon space and i'll answer that later uh, girish i would like to talk a little bit about uh, the area of managed forests and uh, it's it's an interesting space uh, because you know fsc does have the fsc fm uh, certification but when you talk to foresters in india the uh, from the forest department the first question they would come up with is we already have a forest management plan you know we've been doing that for decades what new can you offer to us right so the you know whether we like to hear this or not the fact is that uh, it is mandated uh, by the law 
that forests in India, the state forest or the central uh, forest, they have to have a management plan. Now, what does forest management plan uh, entail? Probably it will talk about uh, you know, where the harvesting should happen, which are the critical zones, the core areas, as they say, which are the endangered species, uh, you know, patrolling the, the from the day-to-day minutia to the high-level, probably strategic uh, stuff that goes on, right? In case, uh, you know, the uh, how shall I put it? It may or may not be as comprehensive as FSE would like it to be, right? It may be excellent for the local context. Uh, it may be excellent from the regulatory context. And again, one of the debates that we have or discussions we have with the foresters is, foresters say, we follow the law of the land. And, you know, from FSE, the, the feedback is, Absolutely. You know, even FSC, the first principle is follow the law of the land. But then the question is, can we, uh, you know, do something above and beyond, right? So what would a managed forest uh, in, entail in terms of FSC? Number one, uh, if it is a plantation, you know, it should not be a plantation that has come up at a cost of a native forest. You know, you fell down, you clear, clear out a forest and go ahead and, and have a plantation of, you know, rubber or, you know, whatever other tree species that you want. It should not uh, be monoculture harvesting in the sense a single species is being grown and, you know, you, that's all you're doing because that's not uh, ecologically right, right? You should not be harvesting just one area, you know, have a, have a, you, should, you could probably draw a grid and then every few years or every few months keep rotating the area where the logging is happening. Logistically, it may be difficult. Uh, financially, it may be more expensive, but that's the right way to do it. You know, you can't go ahead and, and randomly uh, start culling trees uh, as the as the uh, trees mature, right? Those are some of the basics. Now, when you are also talking about the human element, uh, there is the element of uh, are you involving the local community? You know, are you you know have you displaced them by your your activities in the forest, uh, or if you are employing them, are you paying them fair wages? Which is a big topic in India, right? There is there is a disparity in wages when it uh, you know across the genders. So those are some of the elements that go into the managed forest space. Uh, there is then there is also the softer element, right? Some trees have religious, cultural values. Some uh, trees have uh, like you know local ge- geographical geological significance. I'm sorry, not geological but geographical significance. They are only found in a particular part of the country. The you know the rubber trees, for example, in Meghalaya, from which the living root bridges are made, very unique to that particular ecosystem. So you know either protection, enhancement, things like that. That also forms a part of the forest management. Uh, that's a way uh, you know we view it. May not be hundred percent applicable. May not be hundred percent accurate. In fact, uh, I believe if you speak to a forester from the you know state forest departments, they may have a different answer. But I think it's just a matter of perspective, and you know I I don't think there's a right or wrong answer to that. Uh, the other part is, as far as FSC is concerned, there are, again, you know, it's, not, I wish, uh, the situation was that it's 100% in line with what we stand for or we, what we would like to see. Unfortunately, that's not the case. There are some plus points. What we also like is that beyond, uh, one or two ministries, you know, driving the whole forest or the green cover, uh, space, there are other government agencies who are also coming into it, right? Um, so the moment we think of forest, we think of state forest department or Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change uh, in Delhi, right? But if you're talking about greening along the highways and there are plans, you know, massive plans of uh, tree plantation or greening, green belts adjacent to the highways, right? Suddenly that's a that's a green cover that is not uh, existing today, but probably could uh, about 10 years from now. The issue here or the concern here that I have or we have are the tree species uh, which are being planted, uh, are they the right for uh, the local environment? Okay, uh, there are a few species. In fact, uh, particularly in southern India, along the railway line, you would find eucalyptus and a few other species planted in you know massive numbers. The question question to ask is: Is that the right species for the environment or the ecosystem? Because uh, is this tree drawing more water? Then it is, uh, you know, the, uh, is it actually, you know, re- depleting the water table rather than adding to it? Is it turning the uh, soil to acidic or alkaline? Is it uh, causing, you know, is the is the fragrance or the odor from the tree causing the uh, causing a nuisance or uh, you know, uh, allergy to the birds and the birds are actually migrating away because of the smell, uh, right? These are the questions that need to be thought at, thought about. That's it. That's the first uh, point. Secondly. 
typically in uh, the large scale tree plantation programs, the survival ratio is very poor. So for every 100 trees planted, probably five of them would see uh, maturity. Okay, it's not all uh, because of negligence and uh, you know uh, what season of the year you're planting the trees in what species you're planting are you watering them correctly are you uh, protecting them correctly you know do cattle come and, and eat eat up the leaves and you know are there other wild beasts coming up and and ripping out the trees from the roots and you know saplings and things like that right so that's the other part that you set us uh, set a goal to plant uh, you know whatever 100 million trees or 200 million trees uh, what are you doing to, you know, what's your management plan for it? How, how are you going to ensure that they would survive and grow into healthy, mature trees, you know, 10 or 15 years from now? Or, you know, if it's a native species which requires 50 years, what's your 50-year management plan for that particular tree species, right? Uh, the other part is that uh, what is your thought process about it? Uh, I spoke about this land pooling part a few, uh, you know, a few minutes ago, right? The question is, uh, I'm a landowner, I plant a tree and probably after 15 years it will get harvested for either timber, paper or packaging like we spoke about earlier. But for the next 15 years, I'm not making any money from that tree. In fact, I have to invest to protect it and, you know, everything else that goes in it to water it and uh, prune it as required. And, you know, it may have weed, it may have uh, insects, uh, infestation, whatnot, right? Uh, a lot of things, it's, it's a life, it's a living being, a lot of things can go wrong. Instead, why not actually go ahead and come up with a plan that who is the end user of this tree once it's felled 15 years from now? Is it a furniture company? Is it a paper mill? Is it a pulp company or a packaging company? Why can't they go ahead and be a financial partner in this today, which A, gives them, you know, material assurance, B, gives, you know, the, so that's a supply chain assurance, B, everything is going to be done or, you know, most of the things are going to be done ethically, transparent, you know, uh, transparently and things like that. So there is supply chain integrity, which is there, right? And for the farmer, they're getting something today, maybe at a discounted rate compared to getting nothing today and something tomorrow, which you, which you can't define today. Uh, it's a good way that you're put into, it has to be an integrated assessment or integrated planning. Like, as you said, if someone needs the resource 15, 20 years later, they should probably join hands with the people who are planting trees and managing the forest up to then. So that's a good way. Incidentally, I mean, as we speak, uh, I kind of was reminded about the statement made by the Prime Minister of India in the address as well. He said, like, planning shouldn't be in silos, but everyone has to do it in an integrated way. So probably even generating carbon sinks and uh, managing forests should also be an integrated approach. So, Omar, we spoke about a lot of things, but on a final note, people, um, generally listeners would want to know, like, what can they do? Of course, they buy books, they buy paper, they obviously see the FSC label. What else can they do to support this cause? Again, that's a very you know, excellent question. And, and I would like to answer that probably uh, in two different ways, right? Uh, number one is as a consumer, like you said before, uh, you know, the, the papers, the, the tetra packs, well, or the packaging in general, uh, and so on, right? There also, um, there are brands which actively support. And uh, so uh, in the show notes, probably I'll send, I'll add the link uh, for uh, the place where you can find the database of organizations which actually are FSE certified, largely in the consumer space or be it plywood companies, uh, furniture companies, uh, paper companies, and so on. So that would be one way that, you know, again, the investment or the uh, you know, the, the focus of the organization towards doing things in a more sustainable manner is rewarded uh, in financial terms or, you know, in terms of consumer loyalty at the end of the day, right? That is one. Uh, second, again, as a consumer, it need not be a business to, you know, B2C relationship, right? You as an individual could be in a, you know, influencing position uh, in the sense of be a part of a purchase committee within your organization uh, uh, your residence welfare association, for example, when we're talking about consumables, uh, paper in the office space, tissues, cleaning supplies, and things like that, look for brands which are supporting FSC. So that's another way that at, a, at an institutional, corporate, organizational level, you can probably uh, influence uh, if you're not the decision maker, you know, in, in these matters. And then, of course, there is, uh, you know, the, the topic that will come up with is uh, the price versus, you know, uh, the non-branded versus uh, uh, non-labeled versus labeled, the price difference between the two. 
But that's the next step of the conversation. I think the, the beginning step is, are we even aware? And let me give you a personal example. Three years ago, uh, I wanted to buy a FSE certified notebook. On Amazon, I did end up buying it, but it was made in Italy. Wow. No Indian notebook manufacturer made an FSE certified notebook. Three months ago, unfortunately, situation was no different. So we spoke about success. For me, that's a personal challenge and a frustration that, you know, why has the needle not moved in the three years? Right? So can the schools who buy in, per- in, in bulk, can the institutions who buy office stationery in bulk, they go ahead and demand that I, this, is the, this is the paper, this is the, you know, this is the certification that I need. Otherwise, we're not going to buy from you, which will probably help move the needle, right? Now, let me also talk about uh, individual taking a more active role beyond, you know, be, beyond, you know, spending money or being a, a, an advocate or a consumer, right? Uh, I mentioned about membership for FSC. Now, FSC has a very straightforward, uh, you know, process for becoming a member. Uh, you need references from two of the existing members. There's a form that you have to fill up. Based on your uh, background, you know, educational, professional background, etc., uh, you would become a member of one of the three chambers, economic, environmental, or social. And that's where you can interact with your peer group, uh, you know, understand from them, learn from them, and probably take the message back to your stakeholders or, you know, your, your environment, your, your office space, and so on and so forth. That would be another way because um, in every interaction that I have had with FSC members, you know, some of them are retired forest officers themselves. Uh, uh, there is one who actually represents a, a workers' trade union. There are some members who are retired professors, uh, and somebody you know even taught at the Indian uh, Institute of Forestry Management. Right? You got people with hands-on experience. Talking to them would would really uh, you know add tremendous value and actually help you think more in a structured, logical way as to how how you know they can contribute further and make an impact. That's wonderful. The second part is really interesting. Um getting more knowledge about this and getting more information about this process is definitely a valuable takeaway in addition to what as a consumer we can probably en- emphasize on some requirements when we buy. So uh, I would just like to add one more part to this, uh, Kirisha. So because of COVID, so every four years, uh, every three years, I'm sorry, there is something called as a general assembly that happens, which is like literally a kumbh mela of all the members and all the stakeholders and supporters of FSC, they all come together. We're talking about like thousands of people who converge. That's the opportunity to again interact, debate, you know, meet and greet and things like that, right? Develop your network in this uh, with like-minded people in this space. The event was scheduled to happen in Indonesia later this year, which because of COVID uh, and other reasons, actually got moved to uh, second half of next year. So that would be another opportunity for any member, any anyone who joins as a member now to actually be a part of that General Assembly and, again, you know, learn, interact, meet and greet, probably form opinions, probably, you know, change their opinions as the case may be, but most importantly, bring back the message, you know. That, I think, would be a great opportunity as well. So that that is another way that uh, individuals can contribute and support. Yeah, that definitely sounds like a session where a lot of myths could be busted. So a lot of people would probably actively participate in such sessions. So hopefully it's a successful event when it happens next year. Amar, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the podcast and uh, have this great conversation with you. I mean, you are an expert and uh, cited very good examples and it was a fantastic conversation. Thanks for taking time to be on the podcast. Well, thanks so much for uh, this opportunity and, uh, you know, it is certainly a pleasure talking. So I've been a listener of Mission Junior. In fact, uh, I think we had a conversation when you were about to launch, right? Some time back. Yes. You know, here we are nearly a year and a half later. So you obviously have had some great guests. And what I noticed personally was that uh, the space that we spoke about, that conversation had not happened. And, you know, that's why I just... True. Reached out to you and thanks so much for agreeing to have me on this show and talk about the things that, uh, you know, that I do and things that excite me. And that was the episode for this week. I hope you enjoyed the conversation and became more aware of how FSC certification works and how forests can be sustainably managed and a lot more about the humble paper. Amar as a person is a passionate storyteller and you would have figured that while he mentioned the story from Mahabharata a classic Indian masterpiece. You can follow his other passion project on the podcast 
by searching for Gatha Story on any platform that you're listening to this on. The links to connect with Amar are in the show notes section of this episode. And more information about FSE and the references made during the conversation will be available on the website missionjunior.com. So you don't miss out on that. As always, your feedback is appreciated. You can do that by sending an email to missionjunior at gmail.com or tag missionjunior. The handle is at missionjunior across Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Finally, hope you have subscribed to the podcast because I'll be back in two weeks time with yet another podcast episode. And if you like the show, do give a rating, write a review or share it with friends and colleagues. It just takes about 30 seconds to share the episode link with three people in your network. So please consider doing that. And with that, signing off, this is Girish Shivakumar. And as always, thank you for listening.